Well, Happy New Year, everyone, and welcome back for another year of Solutions to the Dropout Crisis. This is Terry Cash with the National Dropout Prevention Center, and I'm here with my co-host and colleague, Marty Duckenfield, and we welcome all of you to this monthly radio webcast brought to you by the National Dropout Prevention Center at Clemson University in partnership with Clemson Radio Productions and the generous support of Penn Foster and Catapult Learning. Good afternoon, and Happy New Year to our listeners. Did the holidays go by quickly? Well, I hope everyone had a good break. Um, but we're we're really happy to be back here in the studio, and we're really pleased to be starting off 2012. 2012, <laughs> it's amazing with what promises to be a very informative program, and it's our favorite kind of show. Terry Pickerel, our guest today, is actually right here in the studio of Clemson Radio Productions. Ta-da! Well, I, for one, am ready to learn some new dropout prevention strategies from the array of experts who will be joining us over the coming months. But today's program is a particular interest of mine, as you know, school climate and why it's so important. So we welcome back our regular listeners, and we especially want to welcome new listeners to the program We're really happy you found us, and I know you're in for a treat today, because we not only have the perfect program planned, but indeed, with Terry Pickerel, we have the perfect guest. So I'm eager to get started, and I'm sure you are as well. So first of all, let me remind our listeners of the materials that are provided on the website for today's program. We have a slide presentation, which is in fact a PowerPoint to support today's discussion. Have that open and ready. There's a series of video clips under the heading Understanding School Climate that provide an excellent background for the program. I hope you had a chance to see it before the show today, but it'll be there for you afterwards. We have web links to a fabulous site, the National School Climate Center, and other sites as well. Research articles illustrating the fact that this approach we will discuss today impacts students in all kinds of settings. And then the five-step implementation roadmap, which I know Terry will be guiding us through uh, later today. Well, Terry Cash, it looks like there's quite a lot of information here for our listeners to turn to at the close of the program. Well, yes, Marty, as always, uh, this is an excellent compilation of resources, and today's program is just the first step in learning more about school climate and the guidelines of the national standards, and most importantly, how to get started. That's right. Well, you know, the wonderful thing about these webcasts is that you, the listeners, have the opportunity to engage in discussion with our presenter. And so we invite you now to consider being an active part of the program today. And we have two ways you can connect to us. This is a radio call-in show, so we encourage you to call in your questions for our guest. Our toll-free call-in number is 888-539-8859. And if you're calling from outside the U.S., the number would be 864-656-4549. You may be calling in now or any time during the program. We'll put you on hold for a few minutes, but we'll try and get to as many of your questions and comments as we can during the broadcast. Now, as an added benefit for today's program, if you are a caller, we will send you a free copy of your choice of a National Dropout Prevention Center publication, which you can find on our resource page. Uh, we just give Bob your name and email address and phone number, and uh, we will pursue. And uh, like last year, Marty, your name will go in a hat for a chance to win a free uh, conference registration to the National Dropout Prevention Network to be held in Orlando in October of 2012. Sounds pretty good to me. Uh, It's a great opportunity, and we did have someone come to our last conference who was one of our callers. Uh, We're also accepting email questions sent to our email address, which is ndpc at clemson.edu, If you put the word solutions in the subject line, we can spot it easily. And we'll try to get to as many of those questions as well. And I will say up front, if we do have a a deluge of questions, which would not surprise me, um, Terry Pickerel has uh, promised to respond in kind to all of those. But write to ndpc at clemson.edu, and we will forward them on to Terry. But we're looking forward to all your calls and your questions today. Well, Marty, our topic uh, this month is school climate and why it's important and really why it's such an important dropout prevention um, area of of discussion. So we're extraordinarily lucky to have Terry Pickerel, who is a senior consultant to the National School Climate Center and the co-chair of the National School Climate Council here with us today in the studio. Uh, Terry, we're delighted to have you join us here in Clemson for the Solutions to the Dropout Crisis Show. 
Yeah, thanks, Terry and, and Marty, and it's great to be here on site and actually here in the studio working with you. Well, uh, thank you so much. It's, it's a pleasure, and uh, certainly it's our uh, we're blessed to have you. Uh, the research shows that school climate is an extremely important component uh, that impacts student success. Um, a school climate that is safe, it's comfortable, it's respectful to all who come into the building, and, and quite frankly, it's a prerequisite in my mind for learning to take place and for students to do their best. Uh, we believe that today's program is a very important one, so let's begin. And to be sure to call us with your questions, and again, that number is toll-free, 888-539-8859. And for those cal- calling outside the U.S., 864-656-4549. So, Terry, let's turn to your PowerPoint and uh, learn more about school climate. Thanks, Terry. And if everybody can look at the first page on your PowerPoint, we have the, the title, which shouldn't surprise anyone. It's School, school Climate why it is important. And many times in education we talk about content areas and what school climate is and what we're going to discuss today is really about the context, the context of learning, the context of teaching, the context of relationships, the context of safety, and the context of engagement. So if you just turn to the next slide, we have an overview of the four areas we're going to be touching on today. The first one is we're going to be looking at the conditions for learning and school climate reform. What are the policy and practice trends? Then we're going to look at the school climate research, because I'm sure you're all saying, wow, this might be a good thing, but what does the research show? And we'll be looking at at research on the implications for student learning, graduation rates, and healthy development, not just of, of young people, but also of adults. Then we're going to say, given the research and given the background and the context, what do we need? where do we need to go and why do we need to go there? And then we will end our conversation today with looking at a school climate improvement model, how we implement strategies, and what resources and tools are available for all of you. And as Marty and Terry both mentioned, that we gave you a lot of resources that you can go to after the call to look at, and we're still eager for your questions and also any emails you'd like to send us, and we'll try to get those uh, responded to in the next hour, if not um, right after that. So if you can turn to the next slide, which has the title, Conditions for Learning and School Climate Reform, Policy and Practice Trends. Um, I want to start by saying that like a lot of education issues, that it's not a new tradition. That school climate's been talked about for years, that uh, we say it's a 100-year tradition, and there's various definitions of school climate. Some people call it culture. Some call it conditions of learning. Some call it the supportive learning environment. Um, we're going to talk about a definition that we've developed with the group of, uh, of stakeholders here in the U.S. as a way that we like to define school climate. Um, also, in terms of school climate assessment, I think the question is always like, okay, school climate's important, but how do we assess it? How do we know, know it when we see it, and how do we share the information with others? And so in school climate assessment, it, we're looking at a data-driven process that recognizes not just the voice of students but of parents, school personnel, and community voice as well. And one thing you'll hear me consistently say during the presentation is this is about all the education stakeholders. It's not just about young people. It's not just the gifted and talented. And it's not just the teachers, but it's all the adults that enter our our schools. And I think it's really critical to think about school climate in that most comprehensive way. Um, A lot of school improvement strategies talk about the whole village. ASCD has their whole child initiative. And this is really a way of thinking about if we're asking the whole village to support the whole child, what is the context around that support? What does it mean by being safe and supportive and engaging? So our our belief and value is that school climate really needs to be not just about the nurturing of young people's academic proficiencies, but also about their social, emotional, um, and civic learning as well as career development. And then finally on this slide, we talk about, you know, so what the heck is school climate anyway? And basically, if you think about school climate as the quality and character of school life, and as you all think back to elementary school and middle school and high school and post-high school experiences, you could probably use a verb or an adjective or an, or, uh, or, an, or a noun to describe your school. Um, it might have been caring, joyful. It might have been challenging. Um, and or it might have been really um, difficult for you. And so as you think about school climate, think about your experiences in the K-12 system and think about what was the quality and character of the school life and what would you have liked it to be. 
Um, and we'll be talking about how you can look at that. So when you talk about the quality and character of school life, certainly we want to talk about norms. Um, you know, what, what is the expected expectations and relationships among people? What are the goals as we think about the goals of school uh, and the values associated with those goals? What are the interpersonal relationships? And we all know that, that the research shows that, that having a personal opportunity to learn about things that are relevant to you is really critical. Teaching and learning, what are the kinds of pedagogies that are most effective as we think about uh, creating and sustaining a quality school climate? What are the practices of leadership? And one of the things that we'll talk about, and I hope all of you are committed to, is not only the leadership of those in leadership positions, but the leadership of all those who join in with, with the school setting. Um, and that means bus drivers, cafeteria staff, uh, custodial workers, parents, and others. And then last but not least, as we look at school climate, not just looking at norms and values and, and relationships, but also what are the organizational structures that we have in our schools? How is the school organized, uh, including the kinds of, uh, of opportunities that people have outside of school? So as you think about how is the school organized, and not just on the school grounds and environment, but also how does the, the school enter the community and how does the school welcome the community to be part of its learning environment? Um, the next page, if you could turn to... Um, the title is A Positive and Sustained School Climate, is we're going to take some of those words that we used earlier in concepts and talk about what it really looks like in practice. In, in a, <clears throat> excuse me, an environment that fosters positive youth development and learning so that we can be productive, contributing citizens and having a satisfying life. And one of the things that we're committed to, and I hope all of you are as well, is not to think about our young people as being productive in the future but being productive now. You know, what can a third grader do now to improve not just their life but the life of others? So as we think about the contribution that young people can make, we don't think about their contribution just when they're 18 and can vote or serve in the military, but, in fact, when they're three, four, five years old and, and during their adolescence and pre-adolescent years so that they, they are a contributing member of society and practicing the habits of good civic behavior. So we want to have in our schools, if you think again around the context, we want to have norms and values and expectations that support people feeling socially, mentally, and physically safe. And this is not just about the young people. This is about the adults in schools. And I'm sure we've all gone into schools where we've felt more safe or more comfortable and less safe and less comfortable. And we want to make sure, as we're talking about a school environment, that it's comfortable and, and physically safe for all those people who enter it and leave it. Um, people are engaged and respected. And we ask young people all the time, when you're doing your best, what's happening? And the two things they talk about, along with some others, are being engaged and being respected. And young people can feel that, as we can as well, if we're being engaged, respected, or we're being disengaged or disrespected. Um, students, families, and educators work together to develop, live, and contribute to a shared school vision. And again, it's not the responsibility of a school board to to be the only ones that are, care about a school vision. It's the responsibility of all stakeholders to be concerned about and contribute to what the vision of a school is, and also to continually look at that vision and change it as necessary as things change. Um, Fifteen years ago, we may not have seen words uh, like technology in mission and vision statements, and now we're seeing them. And in the, the great state of Hawaii, one of the things they talk about is the ethical use of technology which, again, I think a lot of young people can use technology, but it's not always for, for good. And so how do, how do we continue to look at the vision and include people in, in a shared vision that's, um, that's al also not just static but, but also is dynamic? Uh, educators model and nurture an attitude that emphasizes the benefits and satisfaction from learning. We as adults learn everything. We, I mean, we learn daily, and I think it's important for us to share with our students that we're learning alongside of them. And finally, each person contributes to the operation of the school and the care of the physical environment. Um, oftentimes when people talk about school climate, they think about is there trash picked up, is it, are there nice flowers out? And this is more than, than that, but it does include the, the, the appearance. Um, one of the things I really want to emphasize in this area of norms and engagement and, 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 and whole holistic ways of looking at our work and the contribution we make is that many times in the education system there are variables we can't control. And those uncontrollable variables frustrate us or they support us. But a school climate is a controllable variable. 
and that what we need to do is find ways of understanding the environment and being able to control it in ways that's effective for for all of us. Um, what I'm going to do is quickly run through the next slide, if you could turn your page, that talks about school climate um, dimensions. And at the end of this slide, I'm going to stop and take questions and see if, if we have concerns or ways that I can better articulate what we've talked about. But we, we've kind of talked in some grandiose and, and realistic ways around around school climate, and we want to put them in the four dimensions or categories. One is around safety. Uh, what are the rules and norms? What is the sense of physical safety? And what's the sense of social-emotional safety? So for a lot of you who are concerned about about bullying prevention and making sure that our, our young people feel safe, that this is a, a, a dimension of school climate that's really important to, to, to look at. That for others, you're, you're looking at relationships among people, and it also means not just about adults and young people, but adults and adults. What respect do adults and adults have for each other, and, and what social supports are there, um, and around school connectedness and engagement. And for all of you in the dropout prevention uh, industry, you talk a lot about connectedness to schools and in and, and the resilience literature. So it's, this is also about relationship building. So we can look at at the dimensions of, or look at school climate through a lens of safety, or we could look at it through the lens of relationships. On the bottom left, also about teaching and learning. And this is one of the things that we uniquely have focused on because a lot of school climate orientations don't talk as much about what goes on in the classroom. And what we're doing is really making sure that teaching and learning is a quality part of the school climate standards and dimensions so that it what, it's what goes on within the classroom around the kinds of learning and teaching that are most effective to create an environment. And one of the things I must say is that as we think about teaching and learning, that we also need to create environments that are conducive to that kind of teaching and learning. So if you're thinking about doing lectures, there's a certain kind of environment that's conducive to that. If you're talking about community-based or project-based learning and having young people go outside of the of the school, those are different kind of climate we need to, to adopt and adapt in that way. And last but not least what was, is the in, external environment. What are the physical surroundings? And, and so for a lot of people who look at, at school climate, they look at one or more of these dimensions. And what we're encouraging people to do is look at them in a holistic way of saying, how do we create norms and values and aptitudes and competencies and commitments for people within our school structure and, and within our school system that focuses on relationships, safety, teaching and learning, and the external environment? Those are not mutually exclusive. In fact, we think the more that they work in tandem, the greater opportunity we're going to have to create uh, the most effective environment for everybody in the school that leads not just to something being integrated, but to a school environment that's, that's quality and sustained. Um, I, I want to stop there to see Marty if, or Terry if there's questions that have come up that uh, that I can respond to. Well, um, this is really interesting, these dimensions of school climate. And, and one of the things that's, uh, uh, as one who uh, travels to a lot of schools around the nation and, and looking at school climate and uh, interviewing and being in, in classrooms and buildings and et cetera, there are often, in this dimension of school climate, there, there's often uh, a dichotomy between what's happening in the classroom versus the entire school climate. And uh, quite frankly, um, even in... Um, perhaps the most challenged schools that I've been in, there still have been some unbelievable, overwhelming, wonderful school climate uh, arenas within those classrooms. And can, could you talk a little bit about that and and uh, sort of what's happening with that dynamic? Yeah, I think that that you bring up a, a great um, point. And and if you think about school climate, it's something that permeates every dimension of the school. It permeates the the staff room. It permeates the gym at a at a at a sporting event, and it permeates the the school bus, and I think that's where the kind of school climate we're talking about is about a consistent quality and character of a school that is consistent regardless of which of those locations one one resides, one is engaged, and one lives in. And one of the things that we've done in my the school district I live in is we've trained bus drivers into how to create a safe, conducive, engaging, uh, physical environment. And it's easy for bus drivers to say, well, I'm going to keep my bus clean. It's a little bit harder sometimes to say, how am I going to engage all these kids? 
I don't know their names. All I know is they get on in the morning and they take them to school and I pick them up. And what they've done is they've really looked at more about the relationships of even asking them a question. Did you have fun today? Um, how Instead of saying, how was school, is to ask a more direct question, which we've trained them, is that what's one thing you discovered today? What's one thing you could teach me? Uh, and we've had um, Latino students teaching our bus drivers Spanish, uh, and every day teach them a new word. It's kind of like, you know, people have on those desk calendars a word of the day. So we have some bus drivers who are learning Spanish one day at a time, one word at a time by by students, so they do develop those relationships. But I think where we fall short on, on school climate is where we think it's something that exists within the walls of a classroom, and what it does is exists within the parameters of how we define school. And mm-hmm. school is a public place, a public space, and an opportunity for engagement. So I think for us, and to answer your question, think about the permeation of, of school climate as something that fits through every crack in every wall. Mm-hmm. And um, and then we, the obligation we have to make sure that what goes on in the staff room is consistent with what goes on in the classroom. Mm-hmm. I mean, in every room in the building, and including the school bus, are places where the school climate is uh, manifested, really. And, I mean, you can feel safe in a classroom, but then go out in the hallways and it's it's torture. Or, well, not school bus, it could be. We actually have had someone write a question, so let me pass that along because we, we do encourage our listeners to participate, and I'll, I'll get to this question, but I'll just throw that phone number out there again in case you just joined us. Uh, it's one eight 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 five three nine eight eight five nine, which is a toll free number. And if you call in, you will be able to have a conversation with Terry Pickerel. Okay, Terry Pickerel. Uh, here's the question from a high school, uh, high school for boys. Actually, it says, "What have been some typical challenges to school climate in a public high school setting?" And what are some effective practices to overcome them? Oh, my. <laughs> uh, that's over to you. And if it's something you want to kind of defer to more in your presentation, but that just came in and I wanted to get to it. Well, let me let me uh, address it briefly, mm-hmm. and then I hope I can redirect uh, address it in, in more precision. Yeah, but, yeah. but I think that one of the challenges is we need to think about our schools much like we talked about the building, also our students in terms of their most inclusiveness. And so oftentimes in our schools we'll say, well, we're taking care of these kids. Yeah. But what we need to talk about is how do we take care of all kids, of Mm -hmm. all students. And so for the gifted and talented, oftentimes they're some of the most disengaged. So how do we create a school climate where they feel safe, that they're engaged and that they have good relationships and and have an external environment? Um, and, and sometimes we let our jocks kind of do what they want to do mm-hmm. because they're jocks yeah. and people who excel in math Olympiads and other things. So one of the things that I would say is a big challenge for all schools is think about the inclusiveness, not just of, again, adults and young people, but also of all young people so that we want to make sure every young person has, has an opportunity to, um, to, to be educated in a safe and quality um, school that that helps meet their needs. Okay, and and more on that later. So to our listeners who pose that question, stay tuned for the completion of that thought. Okay. Um, did, Terry Cash, did you have anything more you wanted to add at this point before we move Terry uh, on? I think I wasn't sure whether you wanted to talk about one other thing. Um, well, I want to talk about school climate assessment, okay. uh, but uh, that that'll uh, come later. I think that'll <laughs> come later. Okay. Okay. Oh oh dear, because um, we have portion this time off for callers and there's somebody calling in bob will let me know we'll carry on and we'll catch this caller later on carry on terry okay i'm going to turn the page and ask you to do the same to go to the policy and practice trends um, titled uh, screen and want to quickly run through some of the things that are happening right now in the u.s that are giving increased interest to um to school climate um In the NCLB, and regardless of how you feel about uh, NCLB or don't feel about it, um, that that it does talk about supporting learning environments. And as we mentioned earlier, it's it's really difficult to not think about the environment as we're also thinking about the teaching and learning that goes on. But and then while it's recognized, it's also not measured. So it's a it's a good thing to have, and it may be a necessary thing to have. But well, we're not quite sure you know, because it's so complicated how to measure it. And so so the good news is it's mentioned. The bad news is it's not uh, accommodated in some type of, of more accountability and responsibility way. 
there's a growing interest in school climate. We recently did a, a 50 state policy scan and find that that up from from 27 states in 07, we now have 32 states who have policy. But again, the downside is only three of those provide technical assistance and only eight states provide funding. So it's like other things where a state will say, we want everybody to do a senior project, but you guys go figure out how to do it. <laughs> and so it's one of the challenges we have. It's 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 perceived as something good and, and again, necessary, but we're not giving you much guidance on how to, in fact, do that. Um, that, that the national school climate um, standards and the benchmarks to promote effective teaching and learning and comprehensive school improvement, we believe is, is a really necessary part of this because any field needs to come to agreement around definition and also agreement around what are the most critical pieces. And, and on the next slide, we're going to get to uh, to those standards. But, but you know, once something become, begins to become popular, then the question is what are the standards around that? We do that in math, in language arts, and in uh, fiscal literacy and others. And so this is another of, of a an opportunity to, to begin to look at uh, at the standards around the school climate. And last but not least is the uh, federal DOE Safe and Supportive Schools program uh, has a lot of strengths and also some limitations. One, it's, it's beginning to look at how do different states measure school climate and and also how uh, what some of the trends are. Um, like with any pilot project, that the variety in the measurement practices and therefore the the consequential impacts in terms of the improvements are going to be variable. And so one of the things the federal government is doing is looking at those kinds of measures that yield the best data so they can be uh, shared beyond these these pilot states. So there's some good news. Things are happening. Things are moving. Things are rising to uh, a modest level of popularity. But as you think about any kind of um, any kind of, uh, of of science or art, that the, the the standards also have to help guide how people think more strategically about that. So one thing is building awareness. The next thing is how do you build adoption? And so to help people adopt school climate standards, we gathered together some really good thinkers and practitioners to come together to work together and also did this virtually to come up with the school climate standards built on the definition and built on the quality and character of the schools that have the dimensions we talked about earlier. So so uh, I'm going to walk through these and give a couple of examples. What I'd like to do is as you look through these next three pages, if you have an example of a school climate that meets the standard or a story that would would emphasize what one of these five standards look like, I would encourage you to call in and, and share that with us. Um, I wish you were all in the studio so we could just turn to you and see your hand raised, but we'll, but I would encourage you to think about over the next couple of minutes as I walk through these five standards is to think also about um, some examples that you could share with us. Okay, um, and I just want to interject here that callers that are on hold or others, that we're going to go through these standards and then we're going to allot a, a period of time for our listeners to weigh in. So those of you who are on hold and those who are about to share stories, um, we'll, we'll go through these next several slides and then get to you. Okay. And I promise to be concise and precise on, on, <laughs> on this. Um, so, so the first one is that the school community has a shared vision and a plan for promoting, enhancing, and sustaining a positive school climate. And that sounds kind of easy to do, but it's really hard to bring the whole community together to have a shared vision and then to have an agreed-upon plan. But as I mentioned earlier about engaging bus drivers, custodial staff, and others, it's not just the business leaders and the opinion leaders. It's also about those people who have daily contact with young people. So one of the standards is a shared vision and a plan. The second standard is about policies. And for anybody who knows me, know that I come from a policy world, and I talk about the only way you're going to establish the prevalence of high-quality practice is to have sustainable policies that encourage, support, and reward those kinds of practices. So a school community has policies specifically promoting the development and sustainability of, of particular outcomes and also a system to address the barriers to learning um, and teaching and reengaging students who have become disengaged. And one of the things I think is really important is as you look at policies is to first look at what policies currently exist that may support uh, school climate. There may be some things in your district or in your school or in your state that are already there in existence and nobody knows about them or there's no accountability assigned to them. Secondly is to look at policies that might impede your work. There might be policies that say, you know, here's some things you can do, but here's some things you can't do because there's risk associated with them or, 
or whatever. So look at what I would call policy impediments. And then look at the kinds of policy options that you would like to adopt or adapt at your state, your district, or your school. So a policy scan or review really looks at existing policy, policy impediments, and then the kinds of policy you'd like to to, to move forward. Uh, I'm going to go to the next page and hope you'll follow me to go to, to, to the third standard, which is about practices. Remember I mentioned earlier that policies support the, the prevalence of high-quality practice. So this is about the kinds of practices that are identified and prioritized and supported. It, it promotes learning. It promotes it, engagement. Uh, it promotes the re-engagement of, of uh, individuals who be- become disengaged. And that includes adults as well as, as young people. I, I think we all know teachers that have been somewhat disengaged or maybe an assistant principal or a dean or a principal. Uh, this is, you know, we want to have standards that re-engage them, re-excite them, uh, put the zeal back into their responsibility to contribute to to the school, and develop and sustain the, the, the number D here, uh, or the letter D, an appropriate operational infrastructure and capacity building uh, for these mechanisms. And so, again, I think oftentimes we say, so who's responsible? And when everybody's responsible, nobody is. But putting into uh, into our systems, uh, organizational capacity building and mechanisms to do this. And so, for example, if you have a, a project-based learning or service learning as an effective practice that, um, that, that creates the kinds of school climate that we want, then we need to find the mechanisms and the operations within a school for how do you do that. And here in South Carolina, there's great examples of service learning coordinators at the district and and, and school level, and in fact, many states have it at the, at the state level. I'm going to turn the page and hope you follow me and go to the fourth and fifth standards before we take some of your stories. Uh, the fourth is that the school community creates an environment where all members are welcome, supported, and feel safe in school. And again, this isn't just about young people. It's also about adults, that having people who may speak a different language feel welcome in our schools. So we really need to look at, at the school community creating this type of environment. And last but certainly not not least is that school community develops meaningful and engaging practices, activities, and norms that promote social and civic responsibility and a commitment to social justice. And that may all sound like a highfalutin thing, but we must remind ourselves that public education was developed in the United States to create the next generation of active, principled citizens. And so we need to create democratic climates in our schools so young people can experience democracy in all its messiness, but also with its focus on social justice and the common good. Um, so, So we really want to think about this is a return to the traditional heritage of American education, of being able to engage our students in democratic ways. And it's really hard to do that if your schools aren't democratically organized. Um, so, Marty, I'm going to stop there and okay. let you take some calls, yeah. and uh, we'll, we'll begin uh, a discussion um, beyond the three of us. Yes, and we, we do encourage those callers at one eight eight five three nine eight eight five nine. Here's our window of opportunity. But we've had uh, Sheila Holigan um, from Arlington, Virginia, and um, we want to get to you, first of all. I've got some also that have been sent in by email, but Sheila... Welcome to Solutions, and um, what have you got to share with us today? Thank you. I just had a question. I work for an organization that works um, very hard at creating positive school climate. So I work with communities and schools, and I also work with Diplomas Now. But one of my questions is about school connected it, connectedness and student voice, and I'm looking for um, – more opportunities to involve students in creating that climate, creating creating a climate that is respectful to everyone, adults and students. So I'm hoping that we hear more about that, particularly how do we create that kind of feeling of getting increased academic achievement and increased graduation rates and helping students feel more connected to the school environment and their communities. Okay. Over to you, Terry. Yeah, Sheila, I think that's a great question. And I think that one of the the things that we've learned is that there's different ways of giving students voice and that oftentimes we err on the side of giving students that are in leadership positions or popular or easy to talk to a voice. Um, And one of the things that we've been working on both at the National School Climate Center and in Special Olympics and some other work that we're doing is how do you include all students in having a voice, number one, 
So how do we train students to be articulate and to be able to express themselves in ways that their peers and adults can understand them? And then number two is how do we help adults be ready to listen to the voice of young people in authentic ways? And, um, you know, some of the things that we've found is by, one, is you model that so that there's a district right outside of Milwaukee that has students with intellectual disabilities on their youth advisory panel for the superintendent, which, again, models for people that here's the voice of, of, of young people that may often not be included in decision-making. So I think, I think it's important to think about inclusiveness. It's important to think about engagement, and it's important to think about the communication ability young people have. And then number the fourth thing is how do we make sure that adults are ready to hear from young people and authentically listen to them? And even at times when they can't take their advice um, because of whatever reason, is to be able to give them that feedback. Um, I have colleagues and I that, that argue quite a bit about the distinction between voice and vote. Um, and and I think that's really a critical. Do we want all people, all young people, to vote and then help make decisions, or do we want them to have a voice? And I think at the school, the young people can determine that. And I've been in schools where a voice is sufficient, and others where they say we need to have young people voting on things in a more, much more democratic uh, way. I also, and I know you're working in a, in, in a high school setting, but. In the elementary schools uh, here again in, in um, South Carolina, every year in Nursery Road Elementary School in Columbia, South Carolina, each of the grades, kindergarten through four, create their own constitution. And so they create the kinds of words around respect and around engagement and around fun that are good for them. So they learn at early ages how to have a voice. And then what we're hoping is that goes up through the middle and the high schools. So I also think that we need to start young and look at this permeation from the youngest age. And I think what Nursery Road Elementary School is doing is just a great example of giving young people. It's their constitution. It's their. It's not their rules. It's their agreements. They don't call them rules. They're not thou shalt not. They're agreements thou shalt. Um, so I think, I think starting early and looking at the difference between voice and vote is really critical and ensuring that adults are ready to hear mm-hmm. the voice of young people. And, uh, Sheila, I would add, we had Thank a, you. a, a you program, uh, a solutions program last year. Dr. Bill Preble at New England yeah. College mm-hmm. um, has an organization, uh, Main Street uh, Academics, and he gave some very specific um, kinds of uh, things that could be done uh, at the school level to uh, to address student voice, to address uh, um, opportunities for leadership, and et cetera. So I would I would uh, recommend that you take a look at Dr. Preble's work at New England College Main Street Academics. Yeah, I think. Um, Thank you very much. And, and Sheila, have we uh, covered everything for you satisfactorily? You certainly have. <laughs> oh, Thank that's you. great. I it. Thanks for calling in. It's always good to hear from Thanks, our Sheila. listeners. Uh, we, we have a listener who's written in, and it's on this same um, topic of involving young people. They want to know if there's some kind of a toolkit to be used. Uh, and they mentioned a student council for a youth-centered uh, conversations or activities promoting positive school climate. Does something like this exist that you know of, or where, where can we um, recommend that people look? Or is this something that, from what you're saying, that you have to do site-specifically or, or what? Well, there, there's some there's some great tools, and maybe what we could do is um, is include that on the website. Some some tools that people can go to. Okay. One of the things I would ask people to think about is is our colleague Anderson Williams out of Nashville has created a continuum that really helps me and others think about about youth and and, and their mm-hmm. contributions. And it starts with on the left youth participation, which is young people participate. Then it moves to youth voice, which is young people have a voice. Then it's youth leadership that youth are are leading. And then it's youth engagement, which they are part of everything that goes on. Again, the permeation of that. Mm -hmm. And you would often think that you would end with leadership. But what Anderson suggests is we end with engagement, which means you don't always have to be leading, but you always have to be engaged. And on that sheet, and I'll I'll get a copy of that, Marty, to you and Terry to put on the website, it talks not only about the young people's responsibility, but also the adult responsibility Mm -hmm. in in, um, not accommodating that, but in fact nurturing and fostering that, which, again, I think is one of the biggest challenges is you can 
uh, get students engaged, but you have to have adults who are willing to have them engaged at high levels. Mm-hmm. Okay. So I'll get, I'll, I promise to get those to you so you can put them on the website. And we will add those to, the, to this particular website, which you're listening to right now. What I love about the web, you can just keep adding stuff and adding stuff. And as we get new things on this topic from Terry and others, we will add them. And so um, I think watching the clock here, we're going to have to move on, Terry. Um, so let's move on to, I guess, the next slide talks about school climate research right we're into now for all of you who are on the uh, on the um the conversation here today either by listening or participating you're saying okay so does it make a difference does school climate make a difference and it all sounds good but so do a lot of things and what we want to do is show you that in fact you know a meta-analysis does show that there's a, a, a increasing body of of empirical research that that is showing the um the the connection between school climate and academic achievement, which I think we're all interested in, but also in terms of increased graduation rates, which for certainly for those of us who are interested in dropout prevention, we want not only to have our students come back to school, but in fact stay in school and in fact graduate. Uh, Decrease in disciplinary rates, uh, increase in effectiveness of risk prevention and health promotion efforts, and increased teacher retention rates. And again, the first four are, are on the young people, the fifth one is on teachers, and don't we want to create a climate where we can do both, engage young people and adults so that they feel like every day school's worth coming to and the discovery of learning occurs every day. And by the way, I have fun being there and I feel safe and and, and I feel like I'm being productive. So so I, I just want this slide is in there to show you there is a a compendium of research and we've we've listed some of the resources where you can find find that. We, we want to go on the next slide, next two slides, to look at some particular, uh, you know, so you've got this meta-analysis that shows that these things work, but some work that the the National School Climate Center conducted with Ohio and the Ohio, Ohio DOE in 06, 07, and 08 looked at school improvement uh, measures, and you can see on the slide, and, and by the way, the, the smaller uh, if you're looking at this on your screen, you can see the difference in the lowest to the highest. If you printed this out and you're reading it on a, a smaller scale, it may not look like there's much difference between those. But, in fact, there's significant difference between low, medium, and high climates as measured by the uh, the, the community uh, the school climate inventory to show the correlation that the higher the climate as measured, that the greater opportunity you have to have school improvement um, across the board, and school improvement measured by a variety of things, most of them uh, state requirements, but also those things that are that are implemented by the district and the uh, and the school. So it's not just academic, but it's also disciplinary, tardiness, absentees, number of dropouts, etc. Uh, and I want to turn to the next slide. And I know I'm kind of going through the research piece quickly, but we do want to get into implementation, which is how do you do this. Uh, and so, th- again, with the same study, looking at low, medium, and high climate, of looking at the graduation rates of students shows an increase as you increase, you know, to a higher climate, to higher incidence of uh, of engagement, of safety, of relationships, and of physical environment, and of teaching and learning, that the greater opportunity we have for students to stay in school and, and to graduate. Um, so... Given, I'm going to turn to the next page where all always research has its limitations. So here's some of the strengths. One, we know school climate matters. Um, it, we know that that it supports school connectedness and uh, and and the importance, especially for all of us uh, engaged in dropout prevention, which is the next one. Which is it aligns with our under with, with our understanding of the drivers of school improvement for all children, but particularly for students. Um, that we label oftentimes at risk. It promotes intrinsic motivation, and, and it engages students and educators. It inspires uh, collective and, and collaborative teamwork, and it affects all educators and students. And when you look at, at issues around resiliency, around connectedness and a sense of belonging, that's the kind of climate we're looking for. And the greater those are, the greater, the more resilient young people are showing so the so that's the good news. The, the, the limitations are that because a, a lot of the uh, of the research is being done prior to definitions and metrics and, and improvement models and implementation strategies that we're going to share with you today, that there's some um, 
there's some lack of common definition, so sometimes it's hard in a meta-analysis to put all the the, the, the facts together. So uh, what is important, I think, in terms of the school climate research is as you're talking to uh, your colleagues and thinking about implementing school climate as a, an accountability system in your school or your district or your state, is that there is research that backs up what you're what you're offering to do. But the most relevant research is always the research you do yourselves. Does it matter in my community? Does it matter in my school? Yes, there's evidence that it, the school climate matters. But in fact, let's find out what measurements of school climate, what 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 um, incidents of school climate we want to measure in our school, and then let's look at how we can improve that, and then look at the evidence that we have in our school, because so, this is all about the localization of of a school climate. Um, and as I mentioned on the next page, we talk particularly about the at risk. Uh, for dropping out of school, recognizing the, the the whole competency of the whole child, promoting student engagement and leadership, uh, looking at the intrinsic motivation to learn, and that it does take a whole village and school climate, again, as, as a comprehensive engagement strategy. And this whole issue around inspiration uh, and motivation, I think, is really interesting. And I, and I in the work that I did in the 80s around um, high-risk students of middle school age, one of the things I found out quickly is education was something we talked about and tried to do. Motivation was something they needed. And I think we always need to look at not only how do we educate young people, but also how do we motivate them? How do we make our lessons relevant to them? And that also goes for us as adults. How do we how do we still um, have the joy of learning, the joy of discovery, and also that we understand that, that we need to be motivated to learn and to change and to do and to do the kinds of work that, that we think um, – need to be done in terms of, of that. So I wish in some ways we had colleges of education and motivation uh, as opposed to just colleges of education because I think for a lot of teachers they kind of understand this whole motivation piece but they haven't been as trained about how to it, it kind of either instinctively or thematically employ it. So I would just have you think about um, school climate as not just a good education strategy but it's also a great, great motivation strategy. And again, thinking back to your classrooms when you were in a K-12 school, elementary or middle or high school, I'm sure there were some schools that were much, or some classes much more inviting. You could hardly wait to get there. And there were other classes where you drug and reluctantly attended. And so what we're trying to do is, again, have the permeation so that all classrooms are those we have joy and we're challenged in. And I think one of the things we continue to hear from young people is they want a school climate that's challenging, that doesn't just honor what they know but pushes them to know to know more. Um, so I'm going to uh, quickly go through the next slide, which, which begins, where do we need to go from here um, and, and, and supporting the whole, the whole child and, and in, in engaging the, uh, the whole community, is that th there's more than one model about how to do this. Um, Many of them are more implicit than explicit. One of the things I want to encourage you to do is to be as explicit as you can and intentional. If you want a school climate that builds resiliency, then let's make sure we're measuring the kinds of elements that build resiliency. Um, it, we'll, we'll still get surprises, but let's let's really be more intentional about what we're what we're doing. Um, there's more experimental that we need to do as well as the ethnographic research. Um, looking at how do you ignite the process, what are the formative assessments, uh, promote more collaborative and trusting adult relationships. Again, you're gonna, you hear that from me several times, but I think it's so critical that school, school climate isn't something we do to young people. It's something we co-create with young people that's conducive, motivational, and educational, and activational for all of us. Um, and how do we understand uh, all the tasks and challenges that shape, that, that shape the school climate process? And then Finally, how do we build capacity that um, engage educators and, and parents and other leaders in professional learning communities and continuous learning? We know, all of us know by looking at the research and our own experiences, that the kinds of professional development that's best done is those that are not parachuted in and, and, and run out, but those that, that establish sustainable systems for having people to continuously learn. And so school climate, again, isn't something we check off, that we did it. It's something that we... we foster every day, and it's something that we need to continue to focus on so that um, it's not just for the students this year, but it's for the students in all of our 
schools in every one of our classes and every one of our curricular and extracurricular activities. Um, Marty, I know you wanted me to quickly get to, not quickly, but now get to, you know, so so how do we do this? Yeah, and I think um, I'm trying to, because I know Terry wanted to talk quite a bit. We we did talk earlier today about assessment, and um, I think there's just a, a, conversa- a brief conversation about that might be appropriate now or shortly. Uh, you guide me on that, but I, I didn't want to miss that because listening to the two of you, it was interesting for me to hear, and I, I certainly think our listeners should benefit from that as well. So, Terry Cash, did, did you feel like you wanted to well, weigh I in do. now? Um, I do, and um, you mentioned and where do we need to go, uh, formative assessments, and um, it would, uh, I, I guess it's in form of a statement of a question, and I guess our listeners then should be looking for, um, not for a tool, but a process is what I'm hearing from you, and maybe something off the shelf is, is, is maybe not the best option. I, I think to initially begin with a process, which is what are those things we want to focus on? And I think that sometimes specific tools guide us um, to, to, to a different destination than we were, where we need to go. And so the process that we're going to talk about here is beginning by planning of saying, what is it we want to change in our school? The other thing, Terry, you and I talked about earlier is the fact that your schools and your districts and your state collect a ton of information. They may already have some assessment of school climate that you may not be aware of, and being able to ask people at the school, district, and state level, are there things already being um, being um, assessed, being counted, data being mm-hmm. collected that we can look at? Um, if you go back to the state of Hawaii and look on their websites, they have some comprehensive education improvement data on there, which is about truancy. It's also about graduation rates. It's about the number of volunteers and the number of volunteer hours that students use. And I would encourage you before you look specifically at a tool is to look at a process of bringing people together and say, what is it that that we want to celebrate about our school? What's working well? And why is it working well? Mm-hmm. And And you can usually figure that out very quickly. People are engaged. People are respected. People are appropriately challenged. People are asked to be part of the process. And then say, so how do we create that in every opportunity and every venue in our school? And then say, if we're going to do that, we already have information on truancy, academic record, and service hours. But do we have, we also need some information on the joy that young people have, their experiences. Uh, We were talking also earlier today that the Carnegie, uh, Carnegie, uh, I'm sorry, the Gallup poll for, for high school engagement asked questions around hope, you know, how hopeful are young people, how engaged are young people, and what do they feel about their well-being. And there's some great questions in there that you may want to think about. Um, did you did you enjoy learning today? Did you have fun today? Were you respected today? And those are questions that, that are – so I, I'm afraid that sometimes if we look at the tool, then we, we lose the essence of what we're trying to create, which is mm-hmm. the kind of climate that we want to do and begin to model what it takes to create that climate. And I always start by the question – What's really working well in your school? Mm -hmm. And when it's working well, what's happening? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then start to say, well, then we we need to replicate that Mm -hmm. throughout our school so that if it's engagement, appropriately challenging, democratically informed, then let's make that part of what we create Mm -hmm. in our school, our district, or our state to look at, um, at how you implement and sustain a school climate process. Well, uh, well uh, thank you so much, and, and we could spend a good deal of good deal of time on that uh, on that topic. And of course, you and I did a little bit earlier. But basically, you, why are we doing it, and where do you want to go with it, and what do you want to do with the results? Right, and 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 uh, and so what I'm going to sh- show to you, and, and thanks for that that segue, Terry. Um, that that the next slide talks about the school improvement models, implementation strategies, resources, and tools. And there are a lot of tools. There's a lot of inventories on the website that that we've listed here. And I think if you Google school climate, you'll find others. Some are oriented toward safety, anti-bullying, some toward character, moral development. Um, But again, I would first go to looking at our five-stage process of of climate improvement, which looks at task and and challenges and implementation. And at the bottom of the of the slide I'm looking at, and hope you are too, the school climate improvement models that we talk about the implementation strategy. And I think these are really critical, that we talk about roles and responsibilities. And I think I'd like to eliminate the word role because role is too uh, passive. A response, I mean, a role is like being a parent. 
-hmm. responsibility is nurturing a human being. And I think those are two different things. I think oftentimes in education we think about roles, but we don't think as much about responsibility. Mm -hmm. And so I would encourage us to think about responsibilities. How do we bring people in to be responsible for co-owning this? So we're not asking people to buy into something we create, but we're asking people to help us create it so that they can co-own that with us. It's their work. It's not our work. And then the formative assessments and igniting the process, again, what motivates parents and, and community members to come into a school is a given task at a given time at a different at a at a given place, and so we need to find precise ways of engaging. And then, last but not least, is the whole issue around capacity building. And I love that it's it's got an ing at the at the end. It's not capacity built; it's capacity building. Uh-huh. So that you're continuing building capacity. And in the in the next uh, colorful slide for those who have. Uh, have it on your screen or print it out in color or color oriented. It talks about the five stages that, that we use uh, or we suggest using uh, the preparation, evaluation, understanding, implementation, and reevaluation. And Terry, to your earlier point on this circle, that stage one is preparation. And preparation to me is bringing the right people together, asking those questions, and then begin to look at in the, in the next stages what already exists. What do we need to, to, to supplant or, or supplement what we already have? And so that, that we begin by asking ourselves a set of questions and bringing the right, the right people to, the, um, to, to the, the, the conversation. And, again, oftentimes we say these are the right people because they're the ones that show up. But we want to have the people who don't traditionally show up. So you're going to have mm-hmm. to have food. Uh, <laughs> you're going to have to do it at an appropriate time. And you're going to have to provide babysitting. And, but that's what it takes to engage mm-hmm. people who you want to have part of your, of your team to do this. The other thing I would like to give people permission to do, not that you need it, but I, I just want to advocate for it, is oftentimes we bring small groups together and we have the small group over a year or or eight month or a ten month period of time work on on a task and work on on this whole thing. I, I would encourage you to think about the kinds of people that you need to help you at stage one, and then whether they're the same type of people that help you at stage two or stage three or stage four or stage five. And give you permission to ask people to come in and help you at the beginning, but then say there's an exit. So you're kind of driving down the freeway, and people come on and people go off. And I think sometimes we exhaust people Mm -hmm. because we bring them on for a longer period of time. Or that they're really competent in preparation, but they're not so good at the implementation. And so I want to have you think about as we go through this process, and I know we're going to do this quickly, is to think about those people that you need at the table with you. Uh, and maybe it's not you anymore. Maybe other people take on the co-leadership of this. But as we think about these processes, think about the changing dynamic of the people you need uh, around to help to make make some of these um, these decisions. So I know that we're getting to the bottom of the hour. Um, but but I do want to let you know that we get to go through the whole five steps, so keep okay. on going. Okay, so <laughs> so this is a, a five step improvement process that again we think is critical. That that it begins by planning for the for the stage of improvement, you know, creating a representative leadership team, and in here we put fostering buy in, and I'd just like you to cross it out and say, you know, foster co-creation because I think that's really important. That we won't want to market this; we want to have people feel like they own it. And, and I think that's a critical distinction. That's a huge difference. I mean, words do matter. And, and so I'm going to cross mine out right now. <laughs> Buy-in is gone. Co-creation is in. Yeah. Sam Chaltain will be very excited. Um, <laughs> he's the one that taught me about that. that. That you're fostering an understanding, a vision, and a, and a vocabulary and engagement. So you're not asking people to understand your vision. You're asking them to co-create the vision so, yes. so they understand it. They can articulate it to others. Excellent. Um, a leadership commitment and dedicated planning team, and I would say team, so that, that the team changes. And, again, you, you'll find more people from Jim Collins' world to get on the bus. Mm-hmm. You may have mm-hmm. a smaller bus, a larger bus, depending on what your task is. But I think it's really important we have the right people on the bus. And, you again, you move from blame and distrust to a no-fault trusting in, uh, environment. Remember one of the things we said that's important, one of the four dimensions, is a whole issue around safety. Yes. And to me, safety isn't just about the physical safety, but the ability for anybody with a minority opinion to be able to raise their hand and feel confident that they'll be heard. And that's mm-hmm. one measure I think is really important in our classrooms, that that we have the ability of being able to be in a minority and being able to state or ask a question that may be 
um, uncomfortable for others. And I and I and I, and again, engaging the community and, and creating outreach. So after you're, after we've done our our initial planning and figuring out what it is we want to do, then we have to ask the question: How are we going to measure this? And and as we measure it, how are we going to interpret the results? Yeah. And I think for a lot of us, we say, well, we're going to measure all this and this and this, and then we'll give it to some um, psychrometician to, to make sense <laughs> of it. And I think the more that the people who create the vision, create the instrument, and create the interpretation, the greater it's going to be. So you may turn a parent into a modest a- analysis or analyst, mm-hmm. and I would, I would just encourage you to do that. It's saying, so if we're going to look at the data, what are we going to do with it? Are we going to make the case? Are we going to raise money? Are we going to show how we're better than somebody else? Are, are we going to look at student performance? I don't know what the answers to those questions are, mm-hmm. but I think as, if you ask the right questions in the beginning, then you, you, you have measurements that toward intentionally toward that. Then what you have is, is an easy interpretation of the results. You're going to say, well, and, and you're also going to find things that surprise you because uh, I always ask people when they look at their data three questions. You know, what informed you? What surprised you, and what challenged you? And I would ask, I would think those are three nice ways of looking at this at data. Mm-hmm. This really surprised me. I didn't realize this would happen. Uh, this challenges me because I'm just not sure how we can do it deeper and broader. Um, and wow, this is a pretty interesting finding we got here. Mm-hmm. Um, so, so those are some easy ways of asking questions around looking at the data. So, so, so you've looked at your vision. You've, you've identified what it is you want to focus on and how you want to focus on it. You've measured it. You now have your interpretation. So then understanding the findings number three on the next page and action planning. So again, understanding and digging deeper, prioritizing goals. So you may have said, you know, we wanted to do four things, but the data show that we're really we're really doing one thing well. But if we did that thing well, boy, the other three would kind of come in line. So you might want to make some adjustments around the kinds of excuse me, implementation strategies that you do. And then looking at what strategies and programmatic efforts may help to get there. So if you're finding that engagement of young people is really working, then how do you look beyond service learning? How do you look at internships? How do you look at mentorships? Uh, and, and one of the things I would, I, and I know this won't be unusual for people on the phone, but we've found that a lot of young people, when we ask them who the caring adult is in their school life, it's the custodial staff or it's the nurse or it's the social worker and, and or it's the cafeteria worker or it's the bus driver. I, I've got to interject this uh, from Leah from Minnesota. I've been holding this one. Um, she says, it's not a question but a comment. Someone said that has stuck with her for many years. Everybody teaches. Lunch lady, teacher. Administrators, clerical, janitor, et cetera. We all teach. Yeah. And we all learn. And we all learn, right. Um, Leah, thanks for that. That's a great motto. I hope you uh, have it up on your wall, and I'm going to put it on mine. Um, <laughs> I think I think it's a great statement, and I think it, it's, again, it's an expectation that should have a responsibility to it. And, again, Terry, I was talking about some of the earlier questions that uh, Gallup asked. Is like, you know, then the question would be, who did you teach today? What did you teach today? What did you learn today? Mm. And asking a student what did they teach and asking a teacher what did they learn yeah. is kind of a, a shift, but it's a great thing to ask every day. Um, yeah. And you can also do that around the dinner table with your family. Um, <laughs> so, so so looking at the at the findings and the and the action planning is kind of the so what. So now we, we've done it. We know why we're doing it. We know what we've done. We, we've now looked at our goals. We've looked at our data, and we're finding we're good on some and not so good on the other. So then what do we implement, and, and how do we implement it, and how do we assess that implementation? So number four is the implementation of the action plan, uh, instructional and school-wide. And, again, the teaching and learning is a critical part of this, but so is the physical environment. And then as in all good um, progressive ways of uh, establishing and reestablishing quality that you always look at, okay, now that we know this much, now what can we do? It's a different vista. You climb one hill, the, the world looks different now at 1,000 mm-hmm. feet, or if you're in Denver at 5,200 feet, mm-hmm. that the world looks different. Yeah. So it's always, that's why we have this as a, as a circle, that, you know, if we had music, we could play you know, the Lion King and the Circle of Life. But the, <laughs> but it is true that this is about the continual um, renewal 
of our work. And if you remember John Goodlad's work, he talks about simultaneous renewal, that you always have to think about about how you move to the next stage and how that next stage informs the next stage. We're smarter today than we were yesterday. We've engaged more kids, so let's or more students, so let's continue to to, to look at our vision and look at our commitments to this work. So so the last page, uh, uh, the implementation strategy, earlier I talked about the, the responsibilities versus the roles, but again, which I think is really important because you want to ask people to take on a responsibility, not just to play a role, um, that you want to make sure that your, your readiness and formative assessments. And one of the things I talked about earlier um, with Sheila's question was about um, – you know, how do we get adults ready? Mm-hmm. And so how do you get a community ready that's going to have a school that has 1,400 young people who are going to um, now be doing service learning in their community? Is yeah. the community ready for that's 1,400 right. young people <laughs> who are going to be coming in and asking really interesting questions around development, around the environment, around the economy? Um, I mean, so we have to make sure that, that we not only study formative assessments, but we also study readiness. Um, and then we also have professional face-to-face professional development. And again, as we think about this and we think about how do we get more teachers involved, we deepen it and broaden it, is that what we've found is that peers educate peers. So having parents teach parents and having students teach teach students is a good way to start. And that's some of the face-to-face professional development. And then having cadres of of uh, of mixed group is great, but I think initially to have parents talking to parents and teachers talking to teachers really uh, really helps to say this is legitimate. It works. I'm I'm in your shoes every day, and I'm really focusing on school climate, um, promoting capacity building from day one. Um, that you know it's not only about capacity building being organization, but it's about our own knowledge and skills. So always looking at how we improve our knowledge and skills and reflect upon those so that we know as we're increasing knowledge and skills and competencies that we're that we're measuring those for ourselves. Um, And then last but not least is the whole issue of engagement, is that a central part of of a school climate is one that's engaging, which means that there's equitable opportunities and obligations for people to be engaged in their own teaching and learning, in the teaching and learning of others, in the motivation of others, and in creating schools that not just are safe, have good relationships, and have a nice environment, but schools that are authentically engaging everyone where there's a sense that I belong here, I'm connected here, and I'm competent, and I'm expected to show my competencies. Um, with that, Marty, I'll turn it back to you um, well, for final questions. Well, I, I kind of wish I was in the different settings of people who are listening to this program today, Terry, because I just know the, exci- the excitement that there's got to be in the conversations if they hadn't thought about uh, these issues as you've presented them uh, to us today. I, I think this is it's got to be this is just the beginning, I hope, of many conversations and other follow up to this important topic of school climate. So um, I'm excited and I just know our listeners are as well. Well, and I think, uh, Terry, it just shows the point that, you know, we measure our schools often quantitatively, but uh, kids drop out qualitatively. <laughs> and uh, some of the issues that you address here, I, I think, certainly uh, certainly address that particular issue. Um, I think you provided our listeners with uh, many answers to the questions about school climate and importance in the learning process and school engagement, as well as uh, you gave us some tools to get started. It's been a wonderfully uh, informative program and there's so many other areas we could explore, but we're at, at the end of our time today, unfortunately. And, uh, I just want you to know we appreciate your time, uh, taking your time to be here with all of our listeners today. It's my pleasure. It's, it's great to travel across the country to be able to spend a couple of days and, uh, and with you and share and learn together. I've, I've learned a lot just in the day I've been here. So thanks for inviting me. Oh, it's, it's, been, it's been our treat, that's for sure. And, and we'll continue to be as we continue to work together. Um, now, I hope that our listeners have found today's program and resources a terrific starting point, as I said, for learning more about school climate. I do uh, recommend that you go back to that website. We're going to put more things up. But uh, this is a great starting point for uh, these conversations. And so I, I want to add my thanks. I don't know if I thanked you sufficiently before, but I'm thanking you sufficiently now. This is, this is a, a great program, Terry. Thank you. It, it, again, my pleasure. Well, we now need to remind our listeners that this radio webcast, like all our 
monthly programs will be archived on our website um, this evening, I hope, and certainly by tomorrow. And it will be downloadable for your iPod or your MP3 players, so you can go back and you can listen again and again. And I do recommend that you uh, tell your friends and colleagues about it. And, you know, with the archive program for a professional development activity, what a great job. And I know we had a lot of calls today from people who wanted to know if we were archiving it because they had a meeting, they had a, you know, a class. They, they, this is an important topic. And so it will live on for eternity on our website. Mm-hmm. Um, and my favorite part... Mm-hmm. It's on iTunes. You can subscribe to Solutions to the uh, Dropout Crisis on iTunes, and so I've, I always find that kind of cool. So that will be up by tomorrow sometime as well. Well, uh, Marty, next month uh, we're pleased to announce that our guest will be Dr. Uh, Dee Steglin from right here at Clemson University. Uh, she's an expert on early childhood education. She'll be addressing the value of early childhood education and the residual impact on school dropout. So mark your calendar for Tuesday, February the 14th at 3.30 Eastern Time for the next Solutions broadcast. Well, thanks to all of you for listening and participating. And remember, we know why students are dropping out of school. And with research-based solutions, we can assure that all our students graduate. Join us next time for more Solutions to the Dropout Crisis.